Theistic Evolution Critique. Theistic Evolution Undermines Christian Doctrines, Part 1. We've been going through the book Theistic Evolution, a Scientific, Philosophical, and Theological Critique. And uh, we are now into Part 3. First, I should reiterate, uh, the book is supposed to be dealing with the origin of life on Earth. And there are several options you can take. You can go with young life creationism, which means a few thousand years ago, maybe six, maybe ten, whatever, um, that God created everything in a special way. Secondly, you can go with what's sometimes usually known as old earth creationism, but because there is a young life, old earth creation, it should really be old life creationism, where God created, but the age is uh, much more, much closer to the standard geologic time scale than it is to anything derived from the biblical record. Then there is intelligent design friendly theistic evolution. God did it in a slow way, but he uh, interfered in ways that you can tell. Then there is what you could call intelligent design antagonistic or non intelligent design theistic evolution, which is that God did it, but he did it in such a way that you can't tell that he did it. And finally, there is atheistic evolution. You can't tell because God didn't actually do it because God does not exist or does not interfere with uh, the world at all. And the book is not actually after that one. The book is uh, aimed specifically at a non-intelligent design theistic evolution. Um, and it tries to remain neutral to the other, the top three, as to which one is correct. But as you will see, the implications are pretty striking. Uh, this particular chapter is written by Wayne Grudem. It's the introduction to the theology part. Uh, we are in now in s section three, the biblical and theological critique of theistic evolution. And the chapter's title is Theistic Evolution Undermines 12 Creation Events and Several Crucial Christian Doctrines. Uh, due to time constraints, we're not going to be able to go completely through the chapter, but we will get about halfway through, and then uh, we'll resume next week. The summary of the chapter itself is this chapter provides an overview of the issues raised by theistic evolution in relationship to the truthfulness of the Bible and several historical Christian doctrines. First, it enumerates 12 specific affirmations about the origin of human beings and other living creatures that are held by the most prominent advocates of theistic evolution today. It then seeks to show that these affirmations are in direct conflict with multiple passages of Scripture, including passages not only from the Old Testament but also from the ten books in the New Testament. It concludes that belief in theistic evolution is inconsistent with beliefs in the truthful of the Bible. Uh, in addition, it shows how theistic evolution undermines 11 significant Christian doctrines. This chapter relies heavily on uh, a few chapters that we will cover later. Uh, <clears throat> notice that um, it does not talk about inerrancy, and we're going to find out why next week. But it talks about uh, truthfulness of the Bible. A summary of the introductory chapter. This chapter must be read in connection with my biblical and theological introduction, which we covered uh, quite a few weeks ago. For there I explain that this book is not concerned with the age of the earth. Notice he's repeating um, that he's not taking sides among those three choices or whether Genesis 1 through 3 should be interpreted literally, or whether people who support theistic evolution are genuine Christians or are sincere in their beliefs. Instead, the question from the standpoint of the Bible and theology is whether Genesis 1 through 3 should be understood as a truthful historical narrative reporting events that actually happened. 
Okay, I define theistic evolution as follows. God created matter and after that did not guide or intervene or act directly to cause any empirically detectable change in the natural behavior of matter until all living things had evolved by purely natural processes. My introductory chapter also quoted several prominent advocates of theistic evolution to show that in order to make their viewpoint consistent with modern evolutionary theory, they have concluded that God was the initial creator of matter, but not of the individual living creatures, that the human race had descended not from merely two original parents, but from something like 10,000 ancestors, and that God selected one man and one woman from the many thousands of humans, human beings on the earth and designated them as Adam and Eve to represent the human race. Now it might be more uh, understandable why they included a section in, uh, um, on Adam and Eve in the uh, scientific uh, uh, section. But this Adam and Eve were not the first human beings, nor did human sin or human death originate with them. Because of these conclusions, advocates of theistic evolution argue that Genesis 1 through 3 should not be understood as historical narrative, but as figurative or allegorical literature. B, an enumeration of 12 theistic evolution beliefs that conflict with the creation account in Genesis 1 through 3. I concluded my introductory essay with an enumeration of 12 points at which theistic evolution, as currently promoted by its prominent supporters, differs from the biblical creation account if it is, to be, if it is taken as a historical narrative. According to theistic evolution, one, Adam and Eve were not the first human beings, and perhaps they never existed. Two, Adam and Eve were born from human parents. Three, God did not act directly or specially to create Adam out of the dust of the ground. Uh, four, did, uh, God did not directly create Eve from a rib taken from Adam's side. Five, Adam and Eve were never sinless human beings. Six, Adam and Eve did not commit the first human sins, for human beings were doing morally evil things long before Adam and Eve. Seven, human death did not begin as a result of Adam's sin, for human beings existed long before Adam and Eve, and they were always subject to death. Eight, not all human beings have descended from Adam and Eve, for there were thousands of other human beings on earth at the time that God chose to... Uh, that God chose two of them as Adam and Eve, assuming that God chose them at all. Um, God, nine, God did not directly act in the natural world to create different kinds of fish, birds, and land animals. Ten, God did not rest from his work of creation or stop any special creative activity after plants, animals, and human beings appeared on, on the earth. 11, God never created an originally very good natural world in the sense of a world that was a safe environment, free from thorns and thistles and similar harmful things. 12, after Adam and Eve sinned, God did not place any curse on the world that changed the workings of the natural world and made it more hostile to mankind. There never was a curse. In the remainder of this chapter, I will attempt to establish the following four points as a response to theistic evolution. Number one, a non-historical reading of Genesis 1 through 3 does not arise from factors in the text itself, but rather depends upon a prior commitment to an evolutionary framework of interpretation, a framework which the science and philosophy chapters in this volume show to be unjustifiable. <coughs> Two, several literary factors within Genesis itself give strong evidence that Genesis 1 through 3 is intended to be understood as a historical narrative claiming to report events that actually happened. Three, both Jesus and the New Testament authors in 10 separate New Testament books affirm the historicity of several events in Genesis 1 through 3 that are inconsistent with the theory of theistic evolution. Four, if the historicity of several of these events in Genesis 1 through 3 is denied, a number of crucial Christian doctrines that depend on these events will be undermined or lost. Even if some readers differ with one or another of the details in my analysis of the 12 points listed above, the remaining points should still be sufficient to demonstrate that theistic evolution is incompatible with Genesis 1 through 3 when understood as historical narrative. That is because my argument is a cumulative one based on the accumulated weight of these 12 historical differences and also very significantly on the 11 threatened doctrines that I will discuss at the end of this chapter.
Four other chapters on biblical and theological topics follow this chapter and provide more detailed support for it. In chapter 28, John Currid analyzes in further detail specific Old Testament passages that are incompatible with theistic evolution. In chapter 29, Guy Walters similarly analyzes specific New Testament passages that are incompatible with theistic evolution. In chapter 30, Greg Allison argues that throughout the history of the church, those who were recognized as leaders and teachers in the church were required to affirm the belief that God is the maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible. That, of course, is a quote from the Nicene Creed, emphasis added. An affirmation incompatible with theistic evolution. In chapter 31, Fred Zaspel concludes that the eminent 19th century Princeton theologian B.B. Warfield, though often cited as a supporter of theistic evolution, would not have agreed with theistic evolution as it is understood today. I must emphasize that what I have written in this chapter depends substantially on the detailed analysis by Curd and Walters in these later chapters. Although I will interact to some extent with alternative interpretations of key passages by authors who advocate theistic evolution, much more extensive and more fully documented interaction with other views has been carried out with substantial expertise in the chapters by Curd and Waters. My purpose in this chapter is simply to lay out the biblical evidence in order to give a clear overview of what is at issue in the debate. C. Genesis 1 through 3 is both similar to and different from other historical narratives in Scripture. Anyone who reads Genesis 1 through 3 immediately realizes that in some ways these chapters are different from other cha historical chapters in the Bible. The subject matter is different, for these chapters do not talk about kings and armies and battles but about the origins of the universe before any human being existed. The method of collecting the information also had to be different, for there were no human observers when God created light and darkness, the sun, moon, and stars, the plants, and animals. And the setting is different because Genesis 2 portrays the Garden of Eden, an idyllic place with no sin or shame, no suffering or death. In addition, the style of Genesis 1 is distinctive because it is written with an elegant six-day structure with majestic rep repetitive phrases such as, and God said, and it was so, and <clears throat> God saw that it was good. See, John Collins appropriately refers to Genesis 1 as exalted prose narrative. But these distinctives do not nullify the fundamentally historical nature of Genesis 1 through 3. And... Uh, when you see green ellipses, I'm skipping over stuff. Um, if you're curious as to what's skipped over, read the book. The uh, D, the analysis of 12 theistic evolution beliefs that conflict with teachings of this, the Bible. One, Adam and Eve were not the first human beings and perhaps they never even existed. As I indicated in my introduction, see pages 61 to 60, 77, some Christians who support theistic evolution believe that the early chapters of Genesis are merely symbolic stories and that Adam and Eve never existed. Others believe that Adam and Eve were actually human historical person, actual historical persons, but they were just one man and one woman out of the many thousands of human beings on earth, and God chose to relate to them personally and designate them as representatives of the entire human race. Both of these groups claim that Adam and Eve were not the first human beings on earth. The evidence from Genesis. Um, and I'll just quote the passage that he quotes. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Notice the Hebrew poetry. And then we back to prose. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Is this passage intended to be understood as historical narrative? The larger literary context is important here. The passage occurs in the first chapter of the first book in the entire Bible, a chapter that tells how all things in the universe began. The subject matter is an explanation of how things originally came into being, which is a historical question. 
the chapter speaks sequentially of the original creation in the, the beginnings of light, land, and sea, plants, the heavenly bodies, fish and birds, animals, and finally human beings. Such a report of the beginning of each type of thing in the creation leads us to think that it is not just a story about choosing one man and a woman to represent thousands of human beings who are already living, but is a story of the beginnings of the human race, the creation of the first man and the first woman. There is, in fact, nothing in this passage that would cause us to think it is non-historical literature. Only a prior commitment to an evolutionary framework of interpretation would cause a reader to search for a way to understand this as figurative or poetic literature rather than historical narrative. But the science and philosophy chapters in this book have proved, provided abundant evidence that such a prior commitment to evolution is unjustified. In addition, Genesis 1 does not stand alone in the biblical text. Genesis 2 is closely tied to Genesis 1 and provides a more detailed account of the initial creation of a man and a woman in God's image. In Genesis 2, we read, The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature. This passage asks us to believe that there was no other human being on earth at this time, for the narrative goes on to say that the man was alone when he was created. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. After that, God brought the animals to Adam so that he could name them, but for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. Here the first man is named Adam. This, again, affirms that there was no other human being on the earth at that time. Finally, God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that God, Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. The narrative in this way presents Eve as the second human being on the earth and the first woman. Sorry. Uh, we find these ideas reaffirmed in later Old Testament passages. Genesis 5 reinforces the idea that Adam was the first human being. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he created him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them. And he blessed them and named them man. Hebrew, Adam. When they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years... He fathered his son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years and he had other sons and daughters. This passage links the specific man, Adam, to the initial creation account in Genesis 1 with the words, when God created man and with clear echoes of Genesis 1, he made him in the likeness of God and male and female he created them. Therefore, Adam is viewed as the specific man created by God in Genesis 1.27, the very first man, and a man who had a son named Seth. Then, almost as if he wants to reinforce to his readers that this is a report of specific historical events, the writer immediately specifies a whole line of descendants leading from Seth directly to Noah and Noah's three sons. Adam and Eve are directly connected to historical persons in the subsequent historical narrative. A later genealogy traces the beginning of the human race back to Adam. Adam, Seth, Enosh, 1 Chronicles 1.1. 1, 1. It doesn't say so here, but it's interesting to note that in the Hebrew Bible, Chronicles slash Ezra slash Nehemiah was the last book of the Bible. Well, actually, so Chronicles would be the second to the last book. Following this verse, we find nine chapters of genealogies. In this genealogy, Adam is again viewed as a historical person who stands at the beginning of the human race. Is this poetic, figurative, or allegorical literature? Francis Collins says Genesis 1 through 3 should be understood as poetry and allegory. It always amazes me as how uh, somebody who has probably no uh, biblical or theological training, certainly not major uh, gets quoted as a an authority in this field um, but but what is the evidence for this no bible translation known to me presents the entirety of genesis 1 through 3 as hebrew poetry which uses relatively short lines one after another in fact we saw some of it we'll see some more uh, and shows evident parallelism in the succeeding sets of balanced lines notice how the translation committees present the psalms for example the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. This is poetry. It contains successive short lines that re-emphasize similar or related ideas, typical of Hebrew parallelism. But Genesis 1 through 3 is not written in this way, and Genesis 1 through 3 is not poetry. It is written as a narrative of historical events. That is why the New Testament authors uniformly treat it as truthful history. In chapter 28 of this book, John Currid points to several additional features in the human linguistic structure, Hebrew linguistic structure, and in the interconnectedness of the narrative that demonstrate that these chapters must be taken as historical narrative, not as poetic, figurative, or allegorical literature. He concludes, if we remove the profoundly historical nature of Genesis 1 through 3, we will remove the historical foundation on which all the remainder of the Bible rests. Nor is Genesis 1 through 3 an extended metaphor. We find metaphorical la language in Scripture, but we recognize it as metaphor because it cannot be literally true. When Jesus says, I am the light of the world, or I am the true vine, my father is the vine dresser, we know that he is not literally the sun or a grapevine, and so we understand it as a metaphor. But there are no such features in Genesis 1 through 3. For thousands of years, interpreters have readily understood the details of Genesis 1 through 3 to be actual historical events. Although if I were arguing devil's advocate at this point, I would say that... Uh, some people who read this feel that it cannot be literally true and therefore they feel it must be metaphor. Um, and uh, uh, so, it, you know, that depends on your view of the scientific uh, evidence and the philosophical implications of it. Nor is Genesis 1-3 an extended allegory. Essential to allegorical stories is that they have a continuous second level of meaning. For example, in the book of Judges, Jotham told an allegorical story. Jotham went and stood on the top of Mount Gerizim and cried aloud and said to them, Listen to me, you leaders of Shechem, and that God may listen to you. The trees once went out to anoint a king over them. <coughs> Excuse me. And they said to the olive tree, Reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, Shall I leave my abundance by which the gods and men are honored? And go and hold sway over the trees. And the tree said to the fig tree, You come and reign over us. But the fig tree said to them, Shall I leave my sweetness and my good fruit and hold sway over the trees? Readers realize at once that this is an allegory, both because trees don't actually talk to each other or go out to anoint a king over them, and both because they recognize that the reactions of the different kinds of trees are specific detail that carry a continuous second level of meaning describing, in this case, various men who had refused to lead the people. But Genesis 1 through 3 is not like this, and it is not an extended allegory. To label a narrative passage in a historical book as an allegory when nothing in the context demands that it be taken as an allegory is not proper interpretation. It is allegorizing. Genesis 1 through 3 should rather be understood as historical narrative. Scott McKnight has recently proposed that Genesis 1 through 3 does not present a historical Adam, but rather a literary Adam who is later viewed as a gene genealogical Adam in Jewish literature. But in order to argue this, McKnight overspecifies what is meant by a historical Adam, so that he makes it include not only what is explicitly recorded in Genesis 1 through 2, but also elements that would not be clearly taught until the New Testament that Adam and Eve passed on their sin natures to all human beings, some theological conclusions that are implied but not explicitly affirmed by the New Testament. For example, if one denies the historical Adam, one denies the gospel of salvation. And one factor that would not be understood until modern genetics, their DNA is our DNA. And of course, you can't find that in the text. McKnight then denies that this kind of historical Adam can be found in Genesis 1 through 2. I have major doubts that when Genesis 1 through 2 was written, any, any of that, or at least most of that, was what was meant by Adam and Eve. Well, yeah, but to argue that Genesis 2, 1 to 2 is not historical because it does not explicitly contain doctrinal material found in Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15 is surely not what historical means in ordinary English. A better understanding is found in the statement of C. John Collins that I quoted earlier. In ordinary English, a story is historical if the author wants his audience to believe 
that the evident that the events really happened. In that sense of historical, McKnight has not disproved that Genesis one through two presents Adam and Eve as historical persons. McKnight also explores various discussions of Adam in extra-biblical Jewish literature, showing that different authors use the Genesis story of Adam and Eve as a platform for expanding on the Genesis narratives with various kinds of moral lessons, philosophical allegories, and creative elaborations on the Genesis story. But his extensive survey turns up no Jewish authors who deny the historical reality of the events that were recorded in Genesis 1-2. Even McKnight admits that Quote, Paul, like the Jews of his day, would have thought that the literary Adam and Eve were also the genealogical Adam and Eve, and that as such they were persons in the history of Israel. Therefore, while Adam, McKnight claimed that we should not view Adam as in, and Eve in Genesis as historical, but rather as literary Adam and Eve, this claim fails to be persuasive. The fact that Adam and Eve are viewed as actual historical persons elsewhere in the Old Testament in later Jewish literature and also in Paul argues for, not against, their historicity. In addition, McKnight fails to even discuss several other New Testament books that also affirm the historicity of Adam and Eve. And we'll have that evidence below. The larger structure of Genesis. After Genesis 1 gives an overview of the entire process of creation, Genesis 2 begins a long, continuous historical narrative that carries all the way through until the death of Joseph in Genesis 50, 26, the end of the book. The entire book of Genesis is connected together as a single historical document in two ways. One, the genealogies in, in later chapters, see Genesis 5, 10, and 11, explicitly tie all of the later historical persons and events back to their direct descendant from Adam, direct descent from Adam and Eve in Genesis 1 through 3, showing that the entire story of Genesis from the beginning is intended to be understood as one historical narrative. Abraham, Isaac, and Dave, Jacob are presented as real historical persons who gen descended from Adam and Eve, and therefore Adam and Eve are also viewed as real historical persons. The introductory phrase, these are the generations of, or a similar expression occurs 11 times in Genesis, and there's the list. This literary device begins with the first link in the chain at Genesis 2 through 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. This phrase is in the introductory heading for Genesis 2, 4 through 4, 26, although some people would argue it actually belongs to Genesis 1. Um, a section that includes the details of the creation of Adam and Eve, the fall, the stories about Cain, Abel, and Seth. The second link in the chain is Genesis 5, 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. And it introduces a long list of Adam's descendants, including Enoch, Methuselah, and Noah. In Genesis 37, 2, these are the generations of Jacob. That's the last one of that bunch. Uh, therefore, this literary device links together the story of Adam and Eve with the stories about the lives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob's 12 sons, stories that are unquestionably intended as factual historical narratives. Therefore, the entire book is intended to be understood as historical narrative. Gordon Wenham said, if the later figures in the genealogies are real people, and they certainly behave in very human fashion, then the earlier characters, the ancestors of Abraham, must also be viewed as real persons. As an interim conclusion, we may say that Genesis 1 through 11 is a genealogy which has been expanded with stories from ancient times to produce an account of the development of the human race from its origin to the time of Abraham. The backbone of Genesis 1 through 11 is an expanded linear genealogy, 10 generations from Adam to Noah and 10 generations from Noah to Abraham. James Hoffmeyer said something similar. I'm just going to skip over in the interest of time. The evidence from the New Testament. In the New Testament, Jesus reinforces the idea of Adam as the first human being, for he says, He who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Jesus must be referring to the narrative about Adam and Eve in Genesis 2, because a man shall leave his father and mother is taken directly from Genesis 2.24. But Jesus also ties this 
Adam and Eve narrative in Genesis 2 to the first creation of man on the earth in Genesis 1. For from the beginning echoes in the beginning in Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Moreover, Jesus quotes Genesis 1.27 with the words, made them male and female. Luke's Gospel traces the genealogy of Jesus all the way back to Adam at the beginning of the human race, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. When Paul is speaking to the Greek philosophers on the Areopagus, he says, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. Um, Adam, of course, is mentioned in Romans 5, multiple verses, some of which we will see later. In 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul explicitly calls Adam the first man. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Skipping over a couple of paragraphs, Adam and Eve were born from human pa parents. This is another theistic evolution proposition. This idea is the second point of tension between theistic evolution and Genesis 1 through 3. Our friends who hold, notice our friends, he's not arguing that they are wicked people. Our friends who hold the theistic evolution to theistic evolution maintain that Adam and Eve, if they ever even existed, were ordinary human beings with human parents, but this presents a conflict with the text of Genesis, which affirms that God directly formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became, and the man became a living creature. If this is understood as a historical narrative, Adam had no human parents but was formed directly from the earth. Eve, of course, was formed from a rib. Luke's genealogy, which we've already seen. Paul also affirms that Adam had no human parent, for he calls him the first man, Adam. The first man, meaning there wasn't a man before him. This is another point of tension with theistic evolution, which requires that Adam and Eve were born from human parents, and that there were only two out of many thousands of human beings on the earth at that time. God did not act directly or especially to create Adam out of the dust from the ground. This point is the counterpoint to the previous point about Adam and Eve having human parents. Theistic evolution required that Adam, if there ever was an Adam, uh, descended from a long line of previously existing human beings. But the account in Genesis 2 claims that God made the first man from the dust. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. As John Currid demonstrated in, uh, demonstrates in chapter 28, which we'll get to, uh, the expression formed the man from the dust of the ground specifies the material from which God made the man because verbs of forming often require two accusatives, an object accusative, the thing made, followed by a material accusative, the material from which the thing is made. The material is dust, that is, the fine and dry crumbs of the earth, specifying that God directly created man from the ground, not from a line of previously existing human beings and nearly human animals. However, in defending the possibility of theistic evolution, John Walton argues that the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground simply meant that Adam was mortal, subject to death. He argues that the verb formed needs not refer to forming a material object, and that's uh, superscript 33, which I missed. He also argues that formed of dust simply means that human beings are subject to death because dust refers to mortality. He quotes Psalm 103, 14, for he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. Where the Hebrew word for, words for formed and dust are the same or similar, and the psalm is speaking about our mortality. Of course, that's quoting from Genesis 3 rather than from Genesis 2. But Walton does not give sufficient attention to the decisive difference in the context of Genesis 2 and Psalm 103. Psalm 103 is poetic literature that speaks elegantly about the fleeting nature of human life. The next verse says, As for man, his days are like grass. When David says he remembers that we are dust, it is an evident allusion to God's punishment in Genesis 3.19. You are dust, and to dust you shall, you shall return. The context of Genesis 2.7 is different. Genesis 2 is closely tied to Genesis 1 as a more detailed explanation of how God created human beings. 
Walton makes a verse about the creation of man into a verse predicting man's death. Here is what Genesis 2, 7 says. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living creature. Now, but according to Walton's interpretation, formed from dust means that man is mortal. If we insert that idea back into the verse, this is what Genesis 2 would mean. Then the Lord God formed man so that he would die and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living creature. Mm, not really. But death is certainly continually seen as a flaw, an enemy. And 1 Corinthians 15, 26 makes that explicit. Therefore, Walton's proposed interpretation is unpersuasive both because of the specific linguistic construction in Genesis 2, 7 and because of the Bible's consistent claim that death was not part of the way God originally created man but was a horrible punishment that came on later because of sin. The next chapter of Genesis also affirms Adam's creation directly from the earth. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. Notice the poetic uh, structure here. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Then the narrative continues. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. Paul says the first man was from the earth, a man of dust. Proposition four that theistic evolution makes that's not compatible with the Bible. God did not directly create Eve from a rib taken from Adam's side. Theistic evolution requires that Eve, if there was an Eve, had human parents, but the narrative in Genesis 2 gives a different explanation of how God created Eve. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Notice he breaks out into poetry. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, shall a, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. Notice this is the passage that Jesus quoted. And they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and not, were not ashamed. The text does not present the creation of Eve from Adam's rib as a minor detail, for it is immediately presented as an explanation for the institution of of marriage in the human race and for sexual union within marriage as a reuni reuniting of two halves that were originally one. Therefore, a man shall hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. John Walton argues that God did not create Eve from Adam's rib, but Adam had a visionary experience where he saw himself being cut in half and the woman being built from the other half. This is something he saw in vision. But once again, Walton has offered an implausible interpretation that does not fit with the actual wording of the text. Elsewhere in Genesis, when someone sees a vision or has a dream, the text makes this clear. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, but God came to Abimelech in a dream by night. And Jacob dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers they hated him even more, he said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Then Joseph dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun and the moon and the seven stars were bowing down to me. Pharaoh dreamed he was standing by the Nile. There are no such contextual indicators of a dream or vision in Genesis 2. Jesus also affirms the historicity of Genesis 2 when he says, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. His words, Have you not read, indicate he is relying on the narrative in Genesis 1-2 and his report in Matthew 19-5 of what God said is a direct quotation from Genesis 2-24. The reasoning is, Eve was taken out of Adam's side, and therefore a man shall hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, and what was separated will be reunited. This therefore statement cannot work unless the reader believes that Eve was created from the rib taken from Adam's side, as reported in Genesis 21, or pardon me, 2, 21 through 23.
Paul affirms the historicity of Eve's creation from Adam's body when he says, for man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Paul is not saying that Adam dreamed this, but that it actually happened. Paul also affirms the accuracy of the history of Eve's creation in Genesis 2 in another epistle when he writes, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. Therefore, both Paul and Jesus understand Genesis 2 as historical narrative, and they claim that the specific details of Genesis 2 are factually true. They actually happened. But theistic evolution must say that Eve was not created from Adam's rib or from any other part of Adam's body at all. Are we willing to say that both Paul and Jesus were wrong? Now, my own take, I think Grudem documents that the biblical record cannot be squeezed into an evolutionary framework. For those of you who are wondering when the text that Eve is, uh, Adam called his wife's name Eve because she's the mother of all living, uh, isn't in section four. It's because it comes later in the document, but it does fit with section four. Uh, everybody is descended from Eve. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, I think one can only pretend that you can squeeze the biblical record into an evolutionary framework by ignoring the biblical record or by denying it. Denial, I think, is the more honest option if you've got to go that way. But this applies to not just to creation, but also to the flood. And if you're going to stick with the Bible, then you've got a flood and you've got a worldwide flood, I think. Um, and that raises interesting questions uh, with the time frame. If one insists that Adam was a real person, then the question arises, when did Adam live? Was it 6,000 years ago, was more or less traditional, or perhaps 10,000 years ago, or uh, was it 200,000 year, years ago, as uh, Y chromosome Adam is supposed to indicate? Or maybe it was 2 million years ago, so that all Homo erectus were descended from Adam? Or was it 5.7 million years ago so that the Crete footprints were made by Adam's descendants? Or, you know, maybe we've got the time scale wrong and, um, and the whole evolutionary theory needs to be revamped. The book wishes to remain neutral between the various branches of intelligent design, but I think if you take the Bible seriously, it is really difficult, if not impossible, to remain neutral on that question. That is why I find this section of the book so fascinating. It goes beyond being neutral. Stay tuned next week for the most jaw-dropping comments about inerrancy that you'll see anywhere. People claiming to believe in inerrancy when they don't believe in the biblical narrative. but. That's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes, comment, um, Jack. I've been wondering throughout this discussion of theistic evolution uh, the following. Is there not a brand of theistic evolution that is not in this book, which admits to the reality of God creating initially, and then left, created in such a way that evolution could continue with the job? Um, well, actually, that would be a, a hybrid of what you might call position two and position three in the list that I gave. That is to say, God created some things and then he allowed for evolution afterwards, uh, maybe guiding evolution afterwards. Um, I think that's a... Uh, uh, My comment is aimed at something about the way this book approaches critiquing theistic evolution seems... In, in the the sense that I'm thinking about, it, maybe contrived or incomplete. I don't think so. At least not in that particular sense. Uh, 
uh, section because what it is critiquing is specifically the idea that God set it up and it kind of turned it onto autopilot or maybe very carefully in the uh, quantum inner spaces, so to speak, changed um, a, a assisting to a uh, uridine periodically or uh, a thymine to a methyl cysteine or something like that. And so you could, you could do a bunch of tweaking with the genetic material, but never ma making it so that it wasn't statistically unbelievable. So that one could... Uh, the the theistic evolution that this is critiquing is a theistic evolution that is terrified of taking a stand against atheistic evolution. Because if it ever does so, a god of the gaps might be what we find. And then... With further study, we'll find out the God of the gaps doesn't exist, and so we will never make a stand that says that atheistic evolution could be proved to be wrong. Yes, uh, that's clear, but and in the process, I, I still feel my, my concerns are real with respect to what this book is doing. Well, I, but see, you can take a partial creation, partial evolution. I, I mean, for that matter, flat out uh, young life creationists commonly will say that mutations do happen and they do show up. And so you have something that in one sense could be called evolution although in another sense it might be, be better to call it devolution. In fact, maybe one of the things we should take up eventually is Darwin Devolves, which is a mm -hmm. fascinating book. Um, but the point is that you can do a whole bunch of mixing and matching. What theistic evolutions are adamantly opposed to is doing any mixing and matching that can be proved or even shown statistically likely to be unobtainable by some route that could not be natural. That's what, um, you know, it's, it's to give you a flavor of, of, of what, it, what this is like, um, if you read um, uh, either Kenneth Miller's um, uh, book uh, on, on uh, Finding Darwin's God or Francis uh, Collins' book, um, The Language of God, I think it is, uh, you will find that they come up to the origin of life where it is obvious that the problems are deep, difficult, hard to solve, very possibly impossible to solve. The origin of life from, a, from, a, from an atheistic perspective. And they will all say, no, 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 don't get excited here. Uh, this... Uh, you know, we might find out that we're going to find an actual naturalistic explanation for the origin of life, and then where will your theology be? That is the mindset that they're criticizing. And you can do all kinds of mixing and matching of, uh, you know, long age uh, creation, long age. Uh, theistic uh, evolution, f uh, uh, f or pardon me, intelligent design friendly evolution. Because, you know, if it happened, let's say the Cambrian explosion happened 500 billion years ago, um, who's to know whether God just 
planted them, as Richard Dawkins says it looks like, um, uh, as, you know, oh, I want some trilobites here. Oh, I want some uh, hallucinogenia here. You know, or whether God took a sponge and did a whole bunch of really fast experiments to, you know, basically do the Craig Venter trick. You know, took out the the uh, uh, the nucleus out of an ovum and then shoved, you know, or perhaps he did it in five stages or twenty stages. You know. Uh, there would be no easy way to tell how that was done. And so from a, from, a, from a scientific point of view in terms of what you would predict to happen, or from a theological point of view as to what God is limited to doing, you can't tell the difference between those two theories or any mix in between. He did the trilobites, but he didn't do the hallucinogenia. Those were just mutations. For example, well, it, it seems like uh, the ID-friendly the, theistic evolution could readily be interpreted, at least in some approaches to it, from what I was saying initially. Yeah, and it seems like the authors are afraid to acknowledge that that's possible. No, they're not, because some of them kind of view things that way. Um, this is a book that Michael Behe could feel reasonably comfortable with up to where we get into the theological stuff. Well, I, there's no clear answer, and I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet. Is comment here, in, uh, and you've got one? Okay. Just a, yeah, just a quick comment on uh, Jack Stout's comments there. Um, it seems like uh, these categories that you list at the very beginning um, have fairly clear boundaries, but in reality, it's a continuum. And there's a lot of, you might say, not a lot, but there's a little bit of overlap between the various categories. And we could actually... Um, find something in between, let's say, position two and position three. And I oh, think yeah, that's easily. What, that's what Jack was uh, bringing up. Yeah. And, and so you, what I look at it theologically, and I wrote an article in Ministry Magazine back in 1983, I believe, where I did a chart on these various views and categories and where the boundaries might be. But then I drew a big, long arrow going from uh, extreme conservative to extreme uh, liberal view as a continuum. And what happens is the more miracle that you're allowed, that you allow in the biblical narrative, the more your view can shift uh, from left to right. And uh, I got a lot of good comments on that from both very conservatives mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. those who are much more progressive. They, they said, yeah, that can happen. A lot of it depends on how much interaction we allow for deity in the creative effort. Mm -hmm. That's all I have to say for now. Well, I, I would make two points to that. One of them is that while there are fluid boundaries, I think there are some that are really difficult to split. The age of life on Earth being probably the biggest one, that one and two don't actually grade into each other very nicely. No, there aren't, if you, you know, you can stretch one out to about 100,000 years. Once you get beyond that, there is a big temptation to flip right into to view two. Uh, and and very few people with view two are going to you know bring it down to let's say uh, twenty million years. It doesn't work yeah. very well. You're right on that. No overlap. Uh, uh, that's one place, and beca that's because there's a you know a testable difference between the theories, and the intermediates get hammered by both sides. Um, 
the other the other point of it is, and I think this is an important point, that I think that God wants it this way. And let me explain to you why I think that. Henry Morris went from being an atheist, as I understand it, to being a Christian. But he held a long age view for a number of years, and then he moved over into short age view. If the long age but Christian view had not been at least a kind of quasi-stable option, I think you can argue that it's not a fully stable option, but, but certainly quasi-stable, then Henry Morris would have had to make a leap all the way over. I don't know whether he could have done it. I see C.S. Lewis making that same leap and then getting over there and realizing, you know, there may be more to this um, and maybe starting to nudge into getting ready to make that second leap. And I think that one of the things we have not adequately realized is that, yes, you can drift slowly towards the, uh, the outside if you want, but you can also slowly drift towards the inside, and I think it's helpful. <coughs> now, that's not always the case. As I understand it, um, when Dean Kenyon went from not believe, you know, being a, a full-fledged atheist, once the origin of life flipped him, he went all the way over into a short-age creationist mode. So you can get that kind of thing sometimes, but it's a big jump. And a lot of people, when they are coming out of atheism, will go into a kind of a, a Lewisian, shall we say, a, a mode, and then gradually flip over the rest of the way. Um, and I think that, although some people can make the full jump in one strip, it's hard, and that God takes it easy on some of us. Didn't uh, didn't Francis Collins start as an atheist and then move to a theistic position? Exactly. And then once he moved that far, he had a tough choice. Is it young earth literal creationism, or is it uh, theistic evolution? And probably more a rejection of the young earth of Whitcomb and Morris view that he ended up where he's at. Uh, Francis that's, Collins? That's my take on it, yeah. Francis Collins? Yeah, Francis Collins never went to that far with the Whitcomb and Morris. Yes, he did you know, not. What I'm Although, saying is he probably looked at it and considered yeah. it and perhaps wanted to go that direction, but never but did. Couldn't, couldn't quite persuade himself that the, that the, that the age question could be sat, uh, satisfied. And, uh, because once you go, if you go, uh, if you go God's active, that is intelligent design, uh, and I know that officially they're not claiming it that, but as as uh, Steve Meyer has gotten in his new book, The Return of the God Hypothesis, everybody knows that that's where it's heading. That's why they don't like it, and that's why they hate being argued with somebody who won't say, well, who is the creator? Mm -hmm. Because what they really want to do is they want to say they're anti-God. But they don't dare say that because then you're saying you're anti-God and, and, and then people don't have to listen to you anymore. Yes? I am. Uh, these, these terms are hard to define and concepts are hard to define and they get, each person tends to define them a little bit their own way and I, I just confuse the picture a little more by throwing in the Bernard Rams progressive creation as a uh, which is similar to Hugh Ross's progressive creation. And so um, there are a lot of ideas out there, but I, I did want to um, commend the uh, presentation today uh, uh, to the extent of a completely uh, irrelevant point that he uh, 
apparently this guy believes in an older universe and creation and one of those brief statements that you read early in the beginning which is an uh, interesting sidelight uh, not to me but uh, yeah. uh, it's, it's a major uh, point of contention in the uh, creation evolution battle but uh, I'm so impressed with the uh, the unity that he was able to tie between Genesis and the, and the rest of the Bible in the uh, question of Adam. And, of course, uh, we come to the issue where the rubber meets the road, and that is time. That is, uh, I assume, at least it seems comfortable to uh, not discuss it, and I'm sure this will come up later in, in our discussion that... Uh, but you sit and uh, say, well, man, if, uh, if this part is so correct, can you s- say, well, the other we're going to ignore? Uh, I, uh, I realize we all ignore things at times. <laughs> uh, the older you get, the more you ignore. Uh, and uh, select what you want to believe, and uh, we need to uh, watch that, uh, that tendency. Uh, but uh, sooner or later, you got to you got to come into this time issue, which is of course where Adventism uh, yeah. uh, comes into the issue more clearly than uh, almost any other force. Yeah, well, it, it's interesting because, uh, as I brought up at the very end, if there was a real Adam. And the genetics certainly supports that. Then where do you place that atom? Do you place it 6,000, 7,500, 10,000? Are you going to go with the supposed genetic evidence, which actually is somewhat questionable as we've been through before, put it 200,000, that's what the published literature seems to indicate. You're going to put him mm-hmm. uh, uh, going to put him two million years ago, uh, ago so that you can get all the Homo erectus into his lineage. You know, I mean, uh, Hugh Ross will say it's just a few thousand years ago and Homo erectus and, and, and Neanderthalensis and all that are just... Um, Prehumans. In which case, it's interesting that we're supposed to have. Uh, some of us are supposed to have certain genes that are more common in in uh, in Neanderthalensis than they are in modern humans. Was there intermarriage? And uh, now we get some very interesting uh, racial overtones there. And by the way, if you're thinking that those are racial overtones against uh, uh, blacks, you're wrong. The Neanderthalensis are more common in um, Caucasians and in Asians. So much for that theory. (laughs) But this uh, rely... uh the reliance of this presentation this morning on the on the Bible, uh, but and the might say the indirect ignorance of probably what what's almost a cliche in this class. Uh, uh, the most direct words that we have from God are the Ten Commandments, and He well, they're said, coming up, and He says He did it in six days. They're coming up. Uh, this flies right in the face of that thing. Yeah. But, um, well, uh, you know, uh, if if you're going to go, if you're going to go that way, again, if you if you're trying to make it long age, then you get to put Adam somewhere in that long age, and it gets really complicated. Uh, and uh, it's a lot easier to just say that the uh, that the time frame is off and uh, and you know, here's some evidence for that, and then uh, and then take the Bible more or less the way it's written. 
We uh, we don't tend to uh, uh, feel all that comfortable with, say, a recent creation six days ago because we haven't seen it going on at present. But we're forced into it, uh, at least I am, uh, as the most reasonable answer I can come up with in terms of the fact that I have to recognize as a God uh, and that uh, my science breaks down at a certain point here. Yeah. And I saw I look for another reasonable model. And uh, that one seems most reasonable. Uh, and the same with the flood. You know, it, nothing's happening here. In 100 years from now, you go to look at the Grand Canyon, it's the same thing as it was 100 years ago. Uh, unless you're willing to allow for a change in uh, uh, rates of activity, you're, you're, you're stuck. And our thinking tends to get stuck in that, but I think that's... Uh, uh, we need we need to be, we're forced by our science to yes. avoid the trap of hey uh, just let things well uh, the present is the key to the past yeah we need to avoid that trap uh, it's not logical because so much evidence says hey the present is not the key to the past well uh, uh, probably the best example of that is how long did it take to gouge out the Grand Coulee. And Forty-eight hun- hours, and hundreds of other examples like that. You know, so so let's just uh, let's just stop with the uh, with the uh, things are always the way they have been in the past, uh, and uh, and really, if you take that at face value, then because people don't normally get resurrected now, then Jesus wasn't resurrected, and then why are we fighting about this whole thing anyway? And do I dare write, mention widespread formations out there that are... Oh, sure. <laughs> go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> if you go to the Geoscience Research Institute across the street, there's a neat compilation of three or four pages of quotations by Ellen G. White about other planets and living beings, intelligent beings on other planets. And I'm wondering, and they are unfallen, you know, pristine, Eden-like, Adam and Eve-like um, beings who never were selfish. And we're the one little black sheep in the universe. What do we do about the age of these um, pre-Earth planets well, I think that that question almost answers itself if you start out with uh, the idea that, that God created us and then there was a fall. Uh, because if you don't fall, then you haven't fallen. Uh, if you do fall, then you're fallen. And that's, uh, you know, the, the, the fundamental questions that need to be answered are, number one, is there evidence for God's activity? And if your answer is yes to that, then... The entire project of explaining everything with natural causes is a fool's errand. And then once you get that, then you need to ask, how long did it take? Knowing that, you can't project into the past without being very careful about your assumptions. And if you do that, then radiometric dating is not as fearsome as it looks. As a matter of fact, it deserves an extra look. And one can start to show that that some of the stuff that's there cannot be related to age. Um, and then you go from there to finding things, including in radiometric dating, and specifically uranium lead dating of um, flood deposits, uh, and uh, specifically including carbon-14 dating, that argues that it hasn't been that long. Don't know how short it is from that, but you can say that it's in the case of one less than 300,000 years, and in the case of another that it's less than 100,000 years reasonably. Well, at that point, you're starting to look at a, a creationist time frame for 
all the way back to, and now it includes the Cambrian, because we actually have material in Cambrian that has, in the published literature, carbon-14. We went over that, what, about a um, couple months ago or so, just before we started this series. So those things are now starting to pile up on them. And at that point, not only do you have to say that God's activity is evident, but you have to start saying, and it didn't take as long as people claim. Wouldn't you also have to assume that these other planets were created maybe a long time before we, Earth? From the point of view of science, we have no evidence plus or minus about those other planets. The only planets that we have really good evidence for, um, whether they're inhabited or not, are the ones in our solar system, and they they don't have inhabitants as far as we can tell. Uh, they don't even have bacteria as far as we can tell. So at this point, we can kind of, we can put that on a shelf and you can do with it theologically whatever you want to, but the science has no influence. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't but, suppose that it did, yeah. considering the size of planets, but at least theologically you would have to assume that these beings on other planets were created before Adam and Eve, well, not at the same time. Well, it's possible that some of them were created after. It's possible some of them were created before, assuming, mm -hmm. again, assuming that they're there, which I happen to like the idea of the morning stars having uh, more than just one person on a per planet to manage. Um, uh, but, you know, as far as that goes, you could put them in another entire universe. Uh, it's multiverse in another direction. Uh, so you, we don't really know. Uh, and all we can do is try to figure out who we trust and what they say and do the best we can with whatever they happen to say. I, I, I would add to that uh, in the context of the great controversy, it's a little hard to squeeze in uh, rebellion in heaven and all uh, this happening uh, during creation week, uh, in fact, <laughs> early in creation week. Uh, to uh, I mean, there's a lot that seems to have gone on before. So you're kind of... Uh, it seems more logical to think, hey, there were some things here before creation week. Yeah, I think that that's, uh, that's a reasonable point of view. I, I, I do think, in fact, it's probably difficult to argue against it. Um, you know, I've talked to people who believe that the entire universe that we see is only, you know, started six to 10,000 years ago and uh, started on the first day of creation, whenever that was. Um, and when I asked them about the morning stars singing together and all the sons of God shouting for joy, their answer was, well, those are in different universes and they were watching us from beyond. Well, okay. Uh, but you still, have, you still have something before creation. That, that creation is not the creation of everything there is maybe everything that we see, but not everything there is. Um, but I, I don't think it really helps us that much until you can make a proposition that says, and if you look here, you'll find this. And as far as I know, none of those theories are really able to say that. And so in a sense, they're not scientific theories. On the other hand, you can say, if you look here, you'll find carbon-14. Or if you look here, you're going to find soft sediment deformation in uh, layers that are supposed to be have 6 million or 10 million or whatever your gaps between them. And at that point, I think you can start to say, and so therefore uh, it is reasonable to believe that maybe they're not 10 million years apart or they're not uh, 300 million years old or something like that. Yes? Seems like in the discussions in this class there's one central question that we keep dancing around 
in all the authors that we discuss, and that is, is there a God, and if there is, what's he like? And does he fit my idea of what he ought to be, and therefore I will build my scientific or theological or whatever ideas around my view of what I think God ought to be, which demonstrates to me that we don't know anything about God, and we keep making him up. We think, well, this theory will fit my picture of God, therefore maybe he exists and maybe he doesn't. I, I don't see a clear um, discussion in most of the authors that we look at in, in what God is like except through the lens of what I think he ought to be. There's an argument from that for going into um, either a book by Steve Meyer called The Return of the God Hypothesis or a book by Ariel Roth called, um, let's see. Science uh, Discovers God. Science Discovers God, which covers basically the same material. All right. I'd like to uh, focus in on the current uh, chapter that we're looking at. And I guess we have a lot more to go on that chapter. We do. You have enough material for three Sabbaths in a row. <laughs> uh, I do, although I'm going to omit most of the third one because oh. I find that it is mostly repetitive. Number one, it's mostly repetitive of a further chapter that we'll get into later. Okay. And... Number two, which is probably more important to me, is it's such a no-brainer. I mean, if you've gotten, if you've gotten the biblical evidence that it actually says this, yeah. then arguing about the theological implications, I mean, it's so obvious. Very good. I will just simply list, here's the implications that he gives. And in the biblical evidence, we'll go over a little bit of the evidence, but the rest of it I'm going to skim over because, yeah. I mean... Isn't it pretty obvious that if you don't believe that the biblical record is what it is, you really don't get a good theory of the atonement? Well, that's that's true theology. You have to start with the biblical evidence. You can't just construct a, a superstructure without laying a foundation of exegesis even. Well, and that's what he's doing here. He's looking at the actual text and what it actual, yeah. and actually says. And that's why I'm says. concentrating on that because... Yeah. Uh, really, once you get the actual text, I mean, you can argue about exactly how it works, but there is a story that is told where we were at first put, or our ancestors were at first put in a garden with no sin. They chose sin. God had to kick them out of the garden. The rest of the history flows, and um, and then Jesus came to restore us However he did it, you know, he came to restore us back to that pristine state. And, and, you know, it's interesting because I would add to his list that it destroys the second coming because, because if we got here by evolution, wouldn't it take evolution to get back to the pristine state again? Good, good. Well, here's, here's the point I wanted to make on that. The... Twelve points are cohesive. They all stand together or fall together. And probably he does a better job of anyone I've seen to put them all together as one package rather than dealing with uh, discrete uh, units and emphasizing some more than another. He yeah. elevates them all to the same level, which uh, it's an asset here. I wanted to mention that Wayne Grudem has been around a long time. I think he's probably retired or close to it. I don't know his exact age. Back in the early 1990s, he wrote his uh, m uh, Magnum Summa, Summa Magnum, which was Christian theology. It's a systematic theology book. And I used that for my doctorate. And he... Um, he clearly came out with a young earth, young life position there, much clearer than what we have here. 
Did he waffle on the universe, or? Yeah, it's obvious he probably has waffled somewhat on that. No, I'm 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 asking because I don't I'll have know, to go back. Because I I tried that. to find it in my library. It's yeah. in storage in a box of books, but maybe next time I'll bring that to see if he allows for an old uh, universe. Uh, what's interesting, the next few chapters are all by uh, young life uh, uh, theologians, as far as I can tell. And you have uh, uh, John Curid, you have Guy Waters. They both teach at Reformed Theological Seminary. You cannot teach there full time unless you are young life. They have to sign a statement. If you go on to Greg Allison, he teaches at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. You have to sign a statement there that you accept young life. The uh, the president of that uh, seminary is definitely young life. I've heard him lecture and his whole staff uh, there. If you go to the last chapter in our book on Warfield, um, by Zaspel, uh, he t- he's a pastor, but he teaches part time at Southern Baptist. He wouldn't get a job there unless he's young life. So it's it's kind of a curiosity to me. Uh, couldn't they find someone that came up with such a strident critique of theistic evolution among the old uh, life position? Maybe they couldn't. I don't know. Maybe maybe they're not too worried about it. Well, Hugh Ross and Fazana Rana and their group yeah. would be the place where I would ex- most expect for somebody to do a biblical exegesis trying to... Uh, but it would be interesting to see what happens. Yeah. The problem I, with Ross and Rana is that they're not trained theologically. I know They've that. They train themselves, and they're very sharp, but... They're not, no one would call them theologians. They're yeah. scientists. Yeah. So the question is uh, are there some prominent theologians out there that would argue the young life position? Well, my suspicion is that if you go the, say, John Walton uh, route, yeah. who is a trained theologian, as I understand he is, it, he is, very much. Um, that Once, once you get that far afield, if if you're not going to have confidence in the, the in the Bible being both uh, accurate and proficuous, uh, that is to say, actually e- easily able to be understood, then you probably. Uh, Will find it very difficult not to just simply say, "When well, I don't know much about the, the uh, about the science, but I'm going to kind of uh, just not. Uh, uh, I, I'm just going to go with the scientific flow because I, and and that's what I. I, I mean, that's what I'm often betting happens. that if yeah. you were to sit John Walton down, he could not give you a scientific. A discussion not. of any of this stuff. Not in detail. Probably not. Yeah. You know. Uh, and I think what's happened is that the book started out as this wonderful scientific book, and they said, well, we really need the philosophy. And then somebody said, well, we really need to look at the biblical record, too, which will make more sense. And you can't find anybody who's uh, who's trusting the biblical record who isn't a short-age uh, creationist? That's, right. That's my guess. But we will see as we go through. Uh, it's fascinating. That's why I say, when I started reading this book, it was interesting enough. When I got to the back end, I, whoa, you can't. <laughs> this is impressive. Anyway, come back <laughs> next week. We will uh, go through the second half of the chapter.